Welcome to McClatchy Maths. My name is Natalie McClatchy and today I'm going to be taking you through Introduction to Pythagoras' Theorem. And this is part of a new playlist and series that I'll be doing on Pythagoras' Theorem and Trigonometry. In this particular video, you're going to find out what Pyth Pythagoras' Theorem is. I'm going to introduce you to the formula and take you through three quick worked examples. And then we'll talk about what's coming up in the next video. This particular video is aimed at our junior students in grade 8, 9 and 10. It's part of the Australian curriculum and does form a very important foundation for later trigonometry. Also, if you're in grade 11 and 12 across a variety of strands in maths throughout Australia, you'll also be touching back on this foundation of Pythagoras' theorem. So this might be a great recap and revision for you as you get started on your senior journey. Pythagoras was a Greek philosopher and mathematician who lived 500 years before Christ. He has been credited with a number of mathematical and scientific discoveries, including the separation of numbers into evens and odds, and the consideration of the Earth as a sphere. He and his followers were fascinated with how the universe worked, and believed that all things were made of numbers, and that there were musical and religious applications for mathematics. One of the major mathematical discoveries that has been attributed to him is his discovery of the relationship between the sides of a right angle triangle, although historians have since discovered that this relationship was used in Babylon and India for hundreds of years prior. Today we will learn about Pythagoras' theorem as part of a study of measurement and geometry. It has practical applications throughout real life, in architecture and construction, in navigation, surveying and mapping. Let's talk about what Pythagoras' theorem actually was. So let's take a little step and talk about the kinds of triangles that we're going to be using for Pythagoras' theorem. We're only going to be talking in this video about right angle triangles. And you would recall that a right angle triangle is represented with a little square in the corner. And that's a 90 degree angle that is formed by those two short sides. Now, we have our long side. I'm going to introduce you to some new vocabulary. It's got a weird name called the hypotenuse. It's our longest side of the triangle. Now, sometimes it can be quite difficult just by inspection to work out which the longest side is. Sometimes they might look like they're all very similar in length. The quickest way to have a look is to look opposite your right angle. So if you're looking at your right angle and you look out to the side straight directly across from it, that is your hypotenuse. Now let's take a little bit of a step backwards and think about what a triangle actually is. I know this might seem a little basic, but I am going somewhere with this. Now a triangle is a two dimensional shape. That means it has sides and each of those sides are made up of one dimension. They are length or breadth or hypotenuse and there's our different sides there. And to actually think about a triangle, when we join those sides together, we end up with what's called a two dimensional shape. Now, when we take each one of those single dimensions, being the length or the breadth or the hypotenuse, and we stretch that out to form a square, it's going to have all four sides being equal to that particular original one dimensional length, and we form this new two dimensional shape. It's a shape of a square. Let's do that on all of our remaining sides. So we take those three sides out, we stretch them and extend them exactly the same length in each direction so that they are three squares that are formed out of that single triangle. Well, Pythagoras actually noticed, and ancient mathematicians alongside of him, noticed that that long side of the triangle, the hypotenuse, when you stretch that out to form a square, it actually was, the, um, its area was equal to the sum of the area of the other two um, squares that were formed by the other two sides of the triangle. And that, this actually works for any right angle triangle. Another way of saying that is that area one is going to be equal to the sum of area two and three, or area two plus area three. As can be seen in the animation on the screen, no matter how the length or the breadth of the triangle changes, so whether we make those small sides bigger or smaller, the area that's formed by the longer side will always be equal to the areas formed by the other two sides combined together. 
Now, a formula was developed to explain this strange phenomenon of the side when it's extended out becoming a square and that hypotenuse's square is equal to the sum of the square of the other two sides. And this is the way the formula looks. C squared equals A squared plus B squared. Now, it's always important to remember, and this is one of the big things I want you to take away from this video today, is that the hypotenuse is always represented with the symbol C. So you'll see in this formula, C squared is on its own on the left hand side of the equation or the formula and on the other side of the equation is A squared plus B squared and our other two sides are going to be called A and B. Now I'll get to that in a bit of a moment but it's really 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 important I want you to write this down I want you to remember it C is always 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 the hypotenuse in this formula. And the other two sides are A and B. Now it doesn't matter whether you call the one that's vertical A and the horizontal one B, or if you flip it around, it doesn't matter because when we add two numbers together, it doesn't matter what order we add those numbers in. Two plus three is the same as three plus two. So A squared plus B squared is the same as B squared plus A squared. So those two little sides are on one side of the formula, hypotenuse on the other side of the formula. So we're gonna do a couple of worked examples with this now. We need to find the length of the unknown side in the triangle shown below. You can see that they've already labelled the unknown side with C and that makes it really easy for us to substitute that into the formula. And we've got two other sides of our right angle triangle that are 8 centimetres and 10 centimetres. Okay, so step one, and we're going to be basically following some steps today. I always like these steps to, to be the same steps whenever you're using a formula. So the first step is write the formula down. And we've just learned that formula, C squared equals A squared plus, plus B squared. Now it's really tempting when you're writing in your book to skip that step and then just jump straight into solving it. And some people could even solve this sort of thing in their head if they were really bright. So I would say, don't do that. Write the formula down. It's really good practice for your exam because in the exam you often get awarded marks for writing the formula. So it's really important that you don't take shortcuts even when you're doing your homework and your schoolwork. Okay, so we've written our formula now. Step two is we're going to state what our variables are. And this is often a step that people skip as well in the interest of laziness and saving time. But sometimes stating variables is actually awarded marks in exams. So it's really important that you state your variables. We know that A is equal to 8. We've just labelled it A. And B, we're going to call B 10 centimetres. We're trying to find C. So C is our unknown. Okay, so now we substitute the information we've got, A is equal to 8, B equals, equals 10. We're going to substitute that into our formula. So C squared is going to be 8 squared plus 10 squared. Often this step of substitution is also awarded marks in exam. So it's very important not to just jump straight to a final answer. Show all your steps of working and then you get full marks. Okay, so now we've got our substitution step. Now we need to evaluate showing working. Evaluate is a big word. All it means is work it out but show all your steps of working. So firstly, we know that 8 times 8, which is 8 squared, is 64. And 10 times 10 is 10 squared, so that's 100. So we're going to write that step down. We've actually worked out 8 squared and 10 squared. Now, if you don't know your times tables, then knowing your basic squared numbers from 1 through 12 is really important for using Pythagoras' theorem. It will save you having to pull your calculator out every single time. So maybe just learn some of those squared numbers. It will really help you down the track as well when you're trying to find square roots of things um, later on in other topics. Okay, so now we've got 64 plus 100. We could do that in our head, that's 164. And now it's probably time to pull the calculator out and find the square root of 164. Because what we need to do to get C all by itself, that's what we're trying to find. We're trying to solve for the unknown side, is find what C is. Now I sometimes find students actually leave the question at C squared equals 164 because they think, well, I found the unknown. Well, you actually haven't. You found what the unknown is squared. So you've actually found that square shape coming out the side of the side. So we actually need to find the square root. Using our calculator, we're going to round that to two decimal places, 12.81 centimetres. And it's always a good idea to make sure when you finish your question to make sure you've got your units on there as you give your final answer. Okay, so I pop my units in there, very important. Okay, worked example two. This time, 
So we've already found the hypotenuse in the last question. We're going to find one of the other sides, the smaller side. Most textbooks will split this kind of thing up into two different exercises. They'll have the first exercise just finding the hypotenuse. The second exercise will be finding smaller sides. I'm going to show you how to do both today. Okay, so we're going to find the unknown side. It's the same steps as before. Step one. Write the formula, c squared equals a squared plus b squared. Now remember what I said earlier, c is always, always, always the hypotenuse. Now sometimes textbooks and exams will get really tricky and they will label the triangle for you in advance and they will call one of the smaller sides c. You are welcome to cross that out and change the hypotenuse to c. Alternatively, if they've given you different letters on the sides of the triangles, you can substitute those new letters into the formula, but you've just always got to remember the hypotenuse is C. Okay, so now we're going to state our variables again. So we've got our hypotenuse is going to be C, and that's going to be five centimeters. A is going to be equal to four, and B is the unknown. Alternatively, I could have done um, A is the unknown and B is equal to four. Okay, so either way is correct. All right, so now we're going to substitute into our formula. So we've got 5 squared equals 4 squared plus b squared. And let's evaluate that now in our small steps showing all of our working. So 5 squared is 25 and 4 squared is 16 plus b squared on that right hand side. And now you can see we've, we're trying to find b all by itself. But at the moment, 16 is added to b squared. So what we're going to do is we're going to subtract 16 from both sides of the equation and we get 25, take away 16 on the left hand side is nine, and 16, take away 16 on the right hand side gives me zero, so I've moved that 16 to the other side of the equation. So now I've got b squared is equal to nine. And if I take the square root of b squared, so I'm taking the square root of both sides of my equation now, because the square root of b squared is just b, and the square root of nine is three. And of course, I'm gonna write centimeters on there because I've been given my units of measurement. Okay, we're gonna have a very quick aside here and talk about something called Pythagorean triads. And these are special groups of numbers called triads or triples. Now, what they are are groups of whole numbers. So they're basically a group of three numbers because a triangle has three sides. And these are three whole numbers that when they are put into a right angle triangle, they will satisfy the formula perfectly. Okay, and so there are groups of these numbers, and if you know the basic ones, you can work out what the other ones are. So a common example of this is called a three, four, five. We actually saw that on worked example two with that particular triangle that we used. We found the unknown side and it was our side square root of nine being three centimeters. Now a three, four, five triangle funnily enough, is actually used in real life on building sites to set out perfect right angles in corners and joints. So on building sites, they actually have this three, four, five triangle made up out of timber, and they actually use that on the work site. Um, a lot of people, my, even my own husband came to me home and he said, what's a three, four, five? Why do we use that on the building site? And I explained to him, it's all about Pythagoras' theorem. So there are some other Pythagorean triads as well. I'm going to give you two examples here, 6, 8, 10 and 9, 12, 15. Now, there is a pattern. You can see it building from 3, 4, 5 to 6, 8, 10 and 9, 12, 15. Do you know what the pattern is? Pause it, see if you can work it out. Well, as you can see, what's happening is, is that each of the numbers in that 3, 4, 5 is getting multiplied by a factor. So to get to the 6, 8, 10, we've actually doubled 3, 4, and 5. And to get to the 9, 12, and 15 triad, we have actually tripled the 3, 4, 5. So that actual principle works all the way along. So it's kind of handy to know, because sometimes when you'll get a triangle, and you might have two sides, a 9 and a 12, if you recognize that that is um, a form of a, tri a triad, you can actually work at the third side without doing a heck of a lot of working. Although it's good to show you working anyway. Let's look at our third worked example today. This is a worded problem. And I often find this is the one where people who are great at working with just simple triangles kind of get a little bit unstuck. So let's read the problem together first. There was a fire in a building on the third floor and it has a window that's 28 meters off the ground. Now the fire department's ladder is 30 meters long, but it must be placed at a minimum of five meters from the wall so that you can safely descend down the ladder. Will the ladder be able to use to rescue the people on the third floor? 
So there's a lot of information in that question. I love drawing a picture first so I can see what's going on. Now, sometimes in exams, drawing a picture is watered marks. However, it's really important when you draw your picture that it's fully drawn properly. And I don't mean you have to use a ruler and measure every side, no, it doesn't have to be drawn to scale. But every variable that's in the question needs to be labeled clearly on your diagram. So it's really clear to the person marking your exam what your picture is showing from the story that's been told. So here's an example. I'm gonna start with a right angle triangle. Notice I've actually drawn the right angle in. This is something that students will often forget. And it's an important part and that could cost you the mark for the picture. What I'm gonna put in there is the placement of my third floor window. So we're assuming that wall is exactly vertical. We've got that window all the way up and we know it's 28 meters off the ground. Notice I've labeled that side with 28 meters. Then we know the ladder is 30 meters long, so I've labeled that side. And now I've inserted my final side, which is, I'm gonna call that side B. I'm gonna use one of the variables because I know it's not the hypotenuse, it's one of the short sides. So I've given it the name B, and it needs to be a minimum of five meters. Okay, so I've chucked my picture to one side. Let's now write our formula. C squared equals A squared plus B squared and state our variables. We know that A is 28, because we decided that that was the side A. B is our unknown, and C is 30. Now, it could be very tempting to actually chuck in B is equal to five here, and I do see students do that on this kind of question. But when we do that, we're gonna see that the formula probably won't work, because it probably won't be exactly five. It's at least to be a minimum of five. So it's better at this stage to leave that one as a variable. It's an unknown. We don't know if the ladder's gonna be safe to ascend, if it's gonna be that far out from the wall. So we're gonna find out exactly how far away it is from the wall at the base, and then we'll be able to answer the problem. So let's substitute into the question. 30 squared, our hypotenuse, is equal to 28 squared plus B squared. And then we're going to evaluate that now in our small steps as we've been doing all the way along. We're gonna subtract 784 from both sides of the equation, and we get B is equal to 116. B squared is equal to 116. And then we take the square root of 116, and we find that B is equal to 10. 0.77 meters. Now we're not quite finished yet. We do need to write a statement. We have worked out how far the base of the ladder is from the wall, but we need to answer the question, will the ladder be able to be used? Okay, so we know that B is 10.77, so we need to write that statement. The ladder will be 10.77 meters from the base of the wall. Therefore, people will be able to safely descend as this is greater than five meters. So we've answered the question, yes, the ladder can be used. And we've also said that 10.77 is greater than five meters. So we've answered that condition that's in our question. So hence the ladder can be used. That's a full complete answer. So don't be just tempted to write, yes, the ladder can be used. You need to give a reason why. Well, we've run out of time, but I'd like to say welcome to anybody who is new to the channel and watching for the first time today. Why not subscribe if you found it helpful? We've got lots of new subscribers that join our channel every week, and I'm so happy to have you here with me. And if you did find this video helpful, why not like and subscribe, tell a friend or a teacher, hit that notifications button so you'll know when all of the upcoming videos are coming, and follow us on social media. We're on Facebook and Instagram. I'd also like to say thank you so much to all of the people who do give me feedback at the channel, um, who um, offer comments or make requests. If you've got a question about anything that's been in this video today, you can contact me at mcclutchymaths at yahoo.com or you could direct message on Facebook or Instagram. Well, I'm Natalie McClutchy and you've been watching McClutchy Maths. Have a wonderful day.